I think you know the drill. I am my beloved's. And his desire is for me. And his desire is for me. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for the Song of Songs. We thank you for the entire word that you've given us. And, and what you have shown us of yourself, Lord, you have opened up and shown so much of who you are. And we're so grateful for that. It's just amazing. It, it strengthens and encourages our faith. And Father, I pray that you do more of that today. Show us Jesus. Draw us into the song. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever do that? You ever read a, just a great book and find yourself in the story? I mean, just maybe you're, you understand the main character or there's another character or something, but you just find yourself so wrapped up or in the story. That is, I believe, what Jesus wants to have you do with the Song of Songs. That this is your song. So get into the song. This is sung about you. It is him singing to you, you singing to him. It is the most personal section, I believe, of the entire word of God as we get to sing with our beloved. Now, we're into the fourth canticle, the fourth song within the song, beginning in chapter 5, verse 2. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved, was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night, he said to her. And she says, I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? My beloved extended his hand through the opening, and my feelings were aroused for him. I arose and opened to my beloved My hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, as to what you will tell him. For I am lovesick. Wow. I, I read through the Song of Songs back when we first, before we started the study. And I ran across this chapter. And at this point in the song, it just, I'm wondering, what is it doing here? And it's so weird. There's a moment here of estrangement that takes place. We're far enough into the song where so much is going on, so much that's good and wonderful and marvelous, and the relationship has just taken off. But suddenly, suddenly, estrangement happens. And I would not have expected that in this place in the song. Why is it here? That's what we're going to look at. But I want you to think about something before we get going, that God has a way of making me aware of my need. He does that with all of us. He makes us aware of our needs. He often does this in our life. I don't realize I have a need, but God knows I have a need. And so he makes me aware of that need. He does whatever it takes to draw my attention to that that place in my life where there is a need. The example that comes to mind goes all the way back to the beginning. Day one of creation, God looked around at what he had made. And he said, it is good. And then on the sixth day of creation, he looked at man and he said... It's not good. (laughs) It's not good that man should be alone. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 picks up the story. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then the story that follows is just great. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature... That was its name, which must have been a lot of fun. You know, Adam there and the animals are just lined up and they're passing by in front of him. And he's naming each one and coming up with with fun and bizarre and strange names as these animals come by. And the man gave names, verse 20, to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Do you think that was a surprise to God? Adam, let's just try out the animals and see if one of them fits. You know? Just see if one is the right relationship for you as he sits there watching them go by. And the Bible tells us that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. 
And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. What was he doing? God showing Adam, you have a need. And I want you to realize you have a need. That nothing else in all creation is right for you, Adam. You have a need. Let me prove it to you. So he shows the need to Adam. And then he fulfills the need from Adam, in Adam, for Adam. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Isha in the Hebrew, because she was taken out of man, Ish. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the man and his woman were both naked and were not ashamed. You see what God did. Adam did not know that he had a need. God did. So the Lord parades all the animals before him to show him his need. And you know what Adam saw? For every hippo, there was a Mrs. Hippo. For every giraffe, there was a Mrs. Giraffe. For every gorilla, the gorilla of his dreams. <laughs> and he looked at these creatures going by and realized, everybody's got a mate but me. I'm all alone in this place. And God showed Adam his plan. I'm going to make one like you, one that is unique. And you will walk with her and she with you. And Jesus held up that as the ideal, God's plan for man and woman, Matthew 19, 4. Jesus said, He who created them from the beginning made them male and female. And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are not, no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Why did God do it this way? To show us we have a need. To show us that not just physically in creation, but as we come to the Song of Songs, we begin to realize we have a need. We have a lover, and his name is Jesus. And we need him. We need him desperately. We had a memorial service here yesterday for a man by the name of Joe Tottenham. Some of you may have known Joe. Uh, most of the people here in the barn yesterday have never been in this barn before. Most of them uh, not involved with the Bridge Fellowship. And it was a marvelous time of just uh, recognizing him. But the best thing about the memorial service was being able to share that in the hospital as he was dying of cancer, Dave and Denise Walton came and they spent time with him. And, and Dave said, Joe, I just, I just got to know. I need to know that you're going to be there with us, that you're going to be in heaven. And Joe said, don't worry about it, little buddy. He said, I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And when someone says that and when someone has that relationship and you've got that connection, it was marvelous. Yesterday I was able to just talk about that. It's not for all the good things that Joe did and he was a good guy, but it wasn't for any of that that, that he's in heaven now. It's because he knows Jesus Christ, the need fulfilled. And Jesus fulfills our need. But sometimes Adam takes Eve for granted. Sometimes the husband stops wooing the wife. Sometimes, as in the story before us, as in this section of the song, the wife says, I'm in for the night, I'm shower pajamas, slippered, and in bed with a good book. <laughs> and you show up with dew-drenched hair, and you want me to open to you? Nice try, lover boy. <laughs> but remember, this is more than just a love song. This is not just about Solomon and some, some bride, some wife that he might have had. This is about Christ and the church. And more personally, it is about Jesus and you. And sometimes Jesus comes along and he knocks on the door and we respond, Lord, I'm in for the night. You know, I got baptized, purified, and sanctified, and now I've got my slippers on and I'm in bed with the good book. And you want me to open more to you? Come back another time. And when I settle into this place, I call it the absence of need. I don't have any more needs. I'm good to go. Me and Jesus, we're good. There's nothing else really that needs to take place in this relationship. The absence of need. When I settle into that place, perhaps I am in need of His absence. There are times where I believe we need Jesus to pull back. We need to open the door finally, you know, after getting up out of bed and making our way to the door, whatever, what, what. And we need to find that He is not there to realize the deep need that we have for Him. And I think that's why this is in this part of the song. 
As we come into the fourth canticle, the bride is now the wife. Verse 1 of chapter 5 is the last time she will be called a bride. From here on out, it's, it's my dove, my darling, my perfect one. She is his wife. The marriage has taken place, chapter 3. The wedding night has taken place, chapter 4. And we come into this fourth canticle and the music becomes not lovely and lilting, but haunting. Because she's having a nightmare. This is the nightmare of the song. Verse 2 tells us, I was asleep, she sings, but, but my heart was awake. What does that mean? She's dreaming. I was asleep. My heart was awake. This is a dream sequence, a nightmare scenario of loss and isolation and estrangement. And as I said earlier, in a strange place in the song, that after all this love and wooing and joy and marriage and marriage night, everything's going great, and suddenly she has this dream of loss. That he calls to her and she goes to him, but then he's not there. And she begins to run and look for him. And we talked about this in depth on Wednesday night, and I encourage you to listen to that. What happens? Even the watchmen of the city, those watchmen who helped her find him before, this time they wound her. They strike her. The guard pulls her shawl off. They don't know who it is. I mean, if they had known it was the bride or the wife of the king, they would not have treated her that way. But here she is, freaking out, racing through the streets, middle of the night, worried, upset, wondering where her beloved has gone. Have you ever felt that way with Jesus? Found yourself wondering, where? Where has he gone? A nightmare of estrangement. And we come to this and we ask, why would he leave? Because he sees a need that she does not yet see. He realizes there's something yet lacking in her heart. She loves him, no question, no doubt. But there's something that's not quite there. He sees the need. And so he distances himself. And his absence is going to bring her, as you'll see, to the desperate realization that she needs him always. The nightmare is not in the song to discourage you or to depress you know, or to dishearten. It is here to wake up the sleepy wife. To wake us up, I believe, when we're in that place of everything's good to go, and I know Jesus, so what else do I need to do? To wake us up and to draw us near to him. And there are three questions that are asked we're going to look at this morning. Three questions in this canticle, complete with answers, to wake us up when we're stuck in the nightmare of estrangement or distance from Jesus. Look at verse 8. After this nightmare has gone on, she says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved... As to what you will tell him, for I am lovesick. And the daughters of Jerusalem sing, What kind of beloved is your beloved, O most beautiful among women? What kind of beloved is your beloved, that thus you adjure us? Question number one. When you're estranged, when you feel at a distance from Jesus, where there's quietness, when you're hoping there will be answers to prayer, and you're not sure where God is or what he's up to, question number one. What kind of beloved is your beloved? Now, before we get into that answer, let me ask you another question. Who's asking? Who's asking there in verse 9? Well, it's it's the daughters of Jerusalem. Well, who are the daughters of Jerusalem? We've identified them. The daughters of Jerusalem may very well be a picture of Israel. Israel asking, what kind of beloved is your beloved? It's perfect. It fits the scenario very well. Because this is exactly what Israel has done for the church. What do you mean? Ask the question. What kind of beloved is your beloved? The Bible, written primarily by Jewish hands, invites us to consider this question. What kind of beloved is your beloved? From the beginning of Scripture to the end of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, the Word of God answers the question. What kind of beloved is your beloved? And so we pour over it. A 66-book library... And God intends, I believe, that we enter in and we take time to consider who He is, what kind of beloved He is. It's not a a quick fix. It's not a fast answer. God says, I want you to know me. So start off in Genesis and let's walk together. Let's take some time together that I might reveal myself to you. And long before we ever get to the New Testament, we have a great idea of who Jesus is. He is all over the pages of the Hebrew Scriptures. The description of Christ. What kind of beloved is our beloved? And we've been looking at that, haven't we? We've seen this over eight years. Continually finding out new and more wonderful things about Jesus. And we're only as far as the Song of Songs. Because He's everywhere in the Word. And the question is answered. You know, 
I say all that because I think that there may be a reason why so many Christians find their faith faltering or find it to be a struggle in their faith life. It's because they have a flimsy picture of Jesus. It's like you go to the mall and you step into one of those little photo booths, you know, and it snaps four pictures and then it comes down at the end. You got the little the little photo strip, black and white pictures of you making your funny faces and whatever. A lot of Christians have a photo strip of Jesus. Little black and white pictures. And they pull it out. You say, hey, can you tell me about Jesus? Oh, yeah, where's, where's that? Here it is. And it's a flimsy little photo strip. And it gives nothing of the character or the depth or the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's the John 3.16. Fantastic verse. Wonderful verse. We should know the verse. But that's all. Well, tell me more about your Jesus. Well, I, that's all I've got. And God gives us this. He gives us a library of photo albums and videos and DVDs. And he says, here, let me reveal myself to you so you can know who it is you're dealing with. And if all you've got is a little photo strip, your faith is going to falter quite often. You're going to struggle because there's not much Jesus there. But there's a lot of Jesus here. And the daughters of Jerusalem would ask the question, what kind of beloved is your beloved? The Apostle John, at the end of his gospel, said in John 21, 25, there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So much of him to know. So much of him to consider and to look at and to think about. And so much right here for us. If we'll start to turn the pages. Because as Jesus said in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. Psalm 40, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. The wrong question when you feel distant from Jesus. The wrong question is, why did you leave me? The wrong question is, God, how could you do this to me? The wrong question is, what have I done to deserve your absence from me? Questions like these fix my eyes on me. And the Word of God says, fix your eyes on Jesus. You don't look at yourself. Tell you what, when I'm looking at myself, it's a mess. When I look at Jesus, things are pretty good. Keep your eyes on Him. So let's answer the question. Listen to the beloved. She begins to answer. She's raced through the streets. She's freaking out. She's upset. She's hurt. She's wounded. And she's wondering where he is. And the first question that is asked, what kind of beloved is your beloved? Verse 10, she starts to answer. My beloved is dazzling and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. He is totally unique. There is nobody like my beloved, she starts to say. But notice how she says it. It's, it's interesting. Dazzling and ruddy. I wouldn't have put those two words together. He is one dazzling, ruddy dude. What? What are you saying? Well, in the Hebrew, dazzling is literally white. And ruddy is red. He's white and red. Sounds a lot like a Washingtonian with a bad farmer's tail. Yeah? That's my beloved. You know, he's red and he's white. What's she saying? She's not talking about skin tone here. White speaks of spotlessness and purity. That's why the NASB translates it dazzling. He is absolutely pure. That's who my beloved is. Completely pure. But he's also red. Adam is the word. From Adam. Adam the word for man. But Adam the word that means red. He's red. Literally dark red. Blood red. And it speaks of humanity. There is blood, red blood coursing through his veins. The vitality of life. And notice that interesting balance there. He's white, he's pure, he's dazzling, but he's also ruddy. He is living. He is God and he is man. Perfect and human. That's my beloved, she says. There's never been anybody like him. Never will be. Revelation chapter 1 verse 12, John It says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed with a robe reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And then he goes on to describe this one who he sees. It's Jesus. And the description is so dazzling that John literally faints dead away. 
But notice the very first thing that John says when he sees Jesus in the Revelation. He looked like a son of man. He's a man. He's standing there before me. He remembers. John hadn't you know, seen him since he ascended some 60 years before. And now he sees him again. And, and it's Jesus, but I can hardly look at him. He's so dazzling. Dazzling and ruddy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 tells us there's one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. And I say, oh, good. So Jesus is a man. He gets me. He understands. He's walked this earth. So he's a man like me. He, and he stands between me and God. He's my go-between. Good, I've got, I've got a man, a vital man that I can trust to go between me and God because he gets me. But then John says in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 of that same passage, he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word is God, and God became flesh. We sang Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, so he's, he's not just man. He's not just the man who understands me. He's the God who can save me. And I love the duality of Jesus here, the God-man nature. The man who gets me, who understands, and the God who saves me. That's how God began to close the gap between us in the first place. When I was distant from God in my sin, He said, listen, let me become like you. I'm going to walk like you. I will show you how I understand you. And then I will save you because I'm God and I have the power to do it. I think we need to get back to that from time to time. If you feel distant from God, go back to square one and stop and say, wait a minute, what kind of beloved is my beloved? Well, he's dazzling God and he is ruddy man. Dazzling God, he can save me, he can pull me out of this despair. And ruddy man, he feels, he gets me, he understands. Verse 11, she sings, his head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a, ra- uh, uh, as a raven. Pure gold speaks of royalty and speaks of deity, like that golden sash girded across the chest of Jesus in John's revelation. And Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30, I am the Father, are one. I am one with God. Colossians 2, verse 9, Paul says, In Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. I mean, can it get any more clear than that? Jesus, both God and man. Royalty and deity, but but what about the raven black locks like clusters of dates? Sounds to me like a really cool set of dreads. You know? You see him there, hanging down? What does it speak of? Changelessness. The changelessness of our beloved. His hair is not streaked with gray. He doesn't have little shots of, of white coming in. He... Perfectly black hair. And she's speaking of one who, boy, this great king doesn't show the signs of aging. The changelessness of the beloved. Jesus Christ, we're told, is the same yesterday and today and forever. It's beautiful. She sings on, verse 12. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. Doves are known for peace. Streams of water, great picture of tranquility and quietness. And if you're to look into the eyes of Jesus, you would see this. Peace and tranquility. And yet both the dove and the stream of water remind us of the Holy Spirit. Both are descriptions in Scripture of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, with the Spirit in His eyes. But look deeper, because she sings that these eyes, as she looks into them, they're bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. What does that mean? No eye strain. He doesn't have those red shots from long, sleepless nights. And what's interesting is earlier in the chapter, we know he'd been out all night. We know he comes in and he says, my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night. He's been out doing what he does. What what does he do? Well, the Bible tells us he never sleeps. He never slumbers. He's always looking after his chosen ones. He's out doing that and yet his eyes are not tired. His eyes never get tired. They are completely reposed, milky white, perfect. And by the way, there's not even the slightest hint of anger in his eyes. Which 
if I came home on a rainy night and my wife wouldn't open the door for me, and I was standing out there with my dreads drenched in... <laughs> what? Drenched in dew? Open up! I'm already in bed. What? I mean, I think there'd be a little eye strain. I think the next time she saw me, I'd be like... <laughs> but not Jesus. And you need to get this. You need to understand. When you feel like you're in a nightmare of separation, you've separated from Jesus, He does not look on you with judgment. And there are so many people who will not grace the door of a church because they think, if I walk in there, I'm going to be judged. I haven't been there in three months. I haven't been there in six months. It's been 20 years since I've gone to church. And if I walk in there, every head's going to look at me. Which, by the way, I don't see that. I haven't seen it in this fellowship. I don't see people wandering in the door and people going, Oh, did you see who just walked in over there? Look at that. We don't do that. And why don't we do that? Because we have all been there. We have all been lost. We are all found. Praise God that he loves us and receives us back. And when we look into his eyes, as we wander back in, after being separated from him, we see eyes of compassion and no judgment, milky milky white in their repose. I think that's what Peter saw. I think when Peter looked over at Jesus the night of his betrayal, Judas betrayed him. The other 11 apostles betrayed him and fled. Peter betrayed him. Three times. I don't know him. I have no idea who that guy is. I don't know this Jesus. And in that second, Luke tells us they must have been close enough to see each other. Because Luke 22.61 says, The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Oh, wow. Can you imagine the sight? I always had thought before, and I think I was wrong, I always thought that Jesus turned and looked and just went, that's what I told you was going to happen. Okay? You get it now? Doofus? <laughs> but he didn't. I don't believe he did. He turns and looks at Peter, and you can, all, you can see the milky white repose in the eyes of Jesus as he says, Oh, Peter. Peter, I love you. I told you ahead that this would happen because I wanted you to know to be ready. It was not a look of judgment that the Lord shot at Peter. I think it was a look of compassion. Why do you say that? Romans 2.4 tells us the kindness of God leads you to repentance. And Peter did not go out and hang himself like Judas did. Peter went out and he wept. And he ached over the loss. His eyes reposed with compassion. Verse 13, the the wife continues to sing, His cheeks are like a bed of balsam, banks of sweet-scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. Of the fragrance of Christ and the beauty of the words that, that literally fall off of His lips. And He would sing to you and sing to me of His sacrifice. His lips dripping with myrrh. And myrrh, again, the picture of sacrifice. As He would say, I died for you to do what you couldn't do. And you're in this place of distance. Look at me. Listen to me. I died for you. Because I knew you'd be in this place. Because I knew you couldn't keep up all the time. Come back to me, He would say. Look at verse 16. It tells us His mouth is full of of sweetness. Boy, I long for that in this world. I wish there was more sweetness in the language that we hear, in the words that are spoken and written. My mother-in-law passed along this article from Useless Today. (laughs) For publishers, sell is a four-letter word. What used to be profane is becoming prevalent and very profitable. Publishing used to be a gentleman's profession, but the trend of using profanity in titles of books, already common in pop songs and even on Broadway, has now spread to books. In the past year, there have been three songs on Billboard's Hot 100 chart with the F word in the title of the song. Chris Rock starred in the Broadway play The Mother Blank with the Hat. And now publishing is awash with bestsellers. whose unprintable titles are for the most part being coyly disguised by asterisks and other symbols over select vowels on the jackets of the books. And they include, and he gives a list that I'm not even going to read. 
And they say books have a lot to compete with these days. Publishing has met with little or no resistance from booksellers for these books with the foul language on them. Stephanie Kuyper, a bookstore seller at Water Street Bookstore in, in New Hampshire, said people really giggle when they see the titles. And they sell with absolutely no help from us. It's totally word of mouth and media attention. No matter how much cursing, sex, and violence is on TV and in movies and in music, people still get a little thrill out of seeing a curse word on a printed and bound book on a bookstore shelf. Want to know why? Sin nature. It it, it calls to something in the heart of man, the heart of woman, that is sinful. And we say, ooh, and it's a sin nature. Not everybody's a fan of the trend. Eric Metaxas, author, author of the best-selling bio of German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And by the way, Metaxas' book is excellent on Bonhoeffer. Check it out. But he said everyone seems to be afraid to say that's wrong for fear of being called a prude. But Kuiper of Water Street Books predicts, I think it's a trend that's only just beginning. That's not what we hear from Jesus. We hear sweet words. Sweet words. In verse 16, skip down. His mouth is full of sweetness. And we need that. You know, part of of being in the Word together like we are is just listening to the words of Jesus. When His Word is spoken, how it washes over us. Pure, sweet, unadulterated words. We need those words today. Luke 4.22 tells us, All were speaking well of Him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. Well, the wife knows that. She's thinking of him. She's remembering him. She's considering him. And she remembers when he speaks, it's beautiful, it's lovely. Verse 14 going on, she says, His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. Rods of gold set with beryl. It's a picture of authority. Rods of gold, the word also means ring. Rings of gold with beryl stones, perhaps a signet ring that a king would wear to ascribe his authority as he sends out letters and documents. And Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. But I love this. The word there for rods, which is also translated rings, has some other definitions to it in the Hebrew. Circle, which goes with ring, or circuit. The word is used to describe regions or areas. The word in the Hebrew is galil. Does that sound familiar? Galilee. It's the word for the Galilee. And we're told by Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later he shall make it glorious by way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galil of the Gentiles. Galil of the Gentiles. And Matthew quotes Isaiah in Matthew chapter 4, verse 15, showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Jesus is the one who comes into the Galil. The one with authority is roaming in the Galilee. And it's a beautiful picture of Christ. His abdomen, she sings, is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. And that is really an interesting verse. It's very intimate. Because what she describes here as she sings is something that only a wife could see. Only the wife would know about her beloved. Externally, if you were to read it in the Hebrew and to see it broken down, it's interesting. It describes an ivory abdomen with branching sapphire blue veins just under the skin. You've got to be awfully close to see that. And that's the external explanation. But internally, both the Hebrew and the Greek languages indicate... The abdomen is the seat of emotion. This is the place of compassion and and passion and love. This is where things are truly felt. The Hebrew word me'ah. Internally, it speaks of emotion and love. And you've got to ask the question, what kind of emotion does Jesus feel when someone is distant from him? What's the emotion of Jesus? We often talk about how we feel. Well, I'm just kind of cut off from Jesus and not really close right now. How does he feel? Not judgmental, gang. Compassion. Because he knows what you need, what I need more than anything else is to be with him. He understands that. We're told in Matthew 9.36, oh, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. The Greek word is splachna. Splachna. It means guts. 
He felt in his splachna for them. And isn't that, that's where we feel things, isn't it? You don't feel it in your heart. If we felt it in our heart, we'd have to go, you know, get an echocardiogram or something, because that would be really wrong. You know, see my wife and all of a sudden, <coughs> no, feel it here. You feel the butterflies in your stomach. You know, if you're upset about something, your stomach starts to churn. It's where our compassion is felt. Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus was moved with compassion. Anytime he he saw the blind or the lost or the lepers, compassion welled up in his guts. Why are you saying this, Rick? Because when you feel lost or distant from him, he feels it deeply. He feels it. And he longs for restoration. Verse 15, she sings, His legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold, meaning strong. Strong legs. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. This guy, man, he's just standing there. He's tough. He's strong. No one's going to blow him over. No one's going to knock him down. Nothing you do or say can knock him out of the picture. Jude says he is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. This is a man you can count on. Verse 16. His mouth is full of sweetness, as we read, and he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved. This is my friend. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. Now something's happening to the bride as she sings this, to the wife as she considers her beloved. Something's changing in her. All of the fear, all of the nightmare seems to be going out of her as she, as she thinks about the one she so loves. But there's someone else that's curious about this as well. The daughters of Jerusalem listen as the beloved is describing her husband. And look at what they say in verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 1. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? <laughs> we got to see this guy. <laughs> They're singing, wow, really? The way you describe him to me? I, I, I want to check him out. The daughters of Jerusalem are excited about this. The daughters of Jerusalem, again, that picture of Israel. But I think, I think we see something here, gang, that as we describe the beloved, as we look at Jesus, as we talk about him and just him, this is how evangelism works. When people hear about Jesus, what does verse 16 say? He is wholly desirable. When you hear about Jesus, you say, I, I like that. When you hear about church, not so much. Got an email from Hunter Bankhart. And uh, Hunter's dealing with some stuff. He's, he's out on deploy right now. And, and uh, dealing with some guys in his squadron and some friends. And in dealing with them, um, they're mostly Catholic. And Hunter wrote a few of us saying, how do I deal with this? Because they're really having a hard time with evangelicalism and they're struggling with this whole thing. And, and I'm trying to, he, he asked, for, can you give me some insight into Catholicism so I can talk to them and, and all that? And I thought about it for a few days and I wrote Hunter back. And I just said, I'll tell you what, first of all, you just need to sit down and read through the Gospel of John just for your own encouragement. But I said, secondly, when you talk to them, don't talk about Catholicism or evangelicalism or any other ism. Talk to them about Jesus. Because Jesus strips down all the barriers. You know, all those differences between us as church people who should be believing the same thing. And we come up with our traditions and all of our isms. But if we talk about Jesus with anyone, there is something alluring about him. And the key to it is that. Talk about Jesus. Don't talk about your church, please. Don't talk about your pastor. Got to come listen to this guy. So they come on a Sunday morning, and it's the worst teaching Pastor Rick has ever given. And they go, oh, oh, that's what you're so excited about. I'm out of here. But if you talk about Jesus, and then they show up, and the teaching's really lame, but I talk about Jesus, there's going to be a connection there, right? That it doesn't depend on how we do but on who He is. Talk about Jesus. That is evangelism. We want to seek Him with you. But something's happening to the wife that happens to you and to me when we consider our beloved, when we consider Jesus. I fix my eyes on Jesus, and what does the Hebrew author say? Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. Do you know what that means? It means I look at him and he finishes me. 
I just look at Him. I focus on Him. I pour over Him. I think about Him. I consider who He is, what He's done. I don't look at myself because that, again, is always messy. But I look at Him and He begins to finish my faith, to perfect it, to work in me and in my heart. Look at Jesus and see Him and He will develop you. He will develop your faith. Question number two, who am I because of my beloved? Who am I because of Him? How am I different because of Jesus? What is He doing that I can see tangibly? Verse 1 of chapter 6, I love this. They sing the chorus, Where has your beloved gone? Oh, most beautiful among women. This is the second time they've said that. They said it back in verse 9 of chapter 5. What kind of beloved is your beloved? Oh, most beautiful among women. Well, where did they get the idea to call her the most beautiful among women? From the beloved. He said it first. Go back to chapter 1. Go ahead. (laughs) Chapter 1, in verse 6, as she's recalling her first meeting with her beloved, and remember what she says? She goes, do not stare at me because I'm swarthy. (laughs) I love that word. I'm a swarthy chick. That's what she's saying. And the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretaker of the vineyards, and I have not taken care of my own vineyard. I have no mirror time because I'm out there working, and you're looking at me. I'm swarthy. And what does he say? In verse 8, he responds to her, and what does he call her? Most beautiful among women. <laughs> He doesn't see the swarthiness in us. He doesn't see when our hair is a mess or the makeup's not on right or the dress is not perfect or all of it. He doesn't see that. He sees the most beautiful among women. And as you trail through this song, she begins to buy it. She begins to believe it. This is how he sees me. Therefore, this must be how I am. And the more she believes that and accepts it, the more those looking at her see it in her. You see how this is working in you and in me? And people will look at you differently if you start to accept that you are as Jesus sees you. You are beloved by Him. You are loved by Him. Who am I because of Him? What has He done in me? What has He done to me? What has He done through me? Jesus is eternally... Listen, Jesus is eternally invested in this relationship. For doing all these things in you. He's given you His love. He is giving you His blood. He's breathed His Spirit into you. You've you've opened up your heart to Him. He has flooded in and He is at work. And i got to ask you, do you really think He's going to walk away from that? Do you think Jesus is going to invest that much of Himself in you and just walk away because you're a little sluggish? It's not how it works. This is Jesus Christ, not Kim Kardashian. (laughs) 72 days. 72 days of marriage for Kim Kardashian. It was a fairy tale wedding. This is the one. Oh, isn't it perfect and beautiful and whatever, you know? And who was surprised? And no offense to her. I feel sorry for her. I feel sorry for all these celebrity weddings that happen because you know they're not going to last. Because you know they're all based on the external. There's nothing internal. And marriage in our culture is a roll of the dice. Unless Jesus is in the center. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't look at you. And when you blow it or when you are faithless or when you're not quite up to par, Jesus doesn't say, I've had it. I'm out of here. Well, yeah, but, but he left when she wouldn't open the door. Yeah, he's given her some space giving her a little room to think about the relationship and where she is and to realize her need. But what Jesus does is He changes us. Sometimes it's incremental. Sometimes it's kind of hard to see. But He is at work. Two familiar passages you've already heard in this, in this teaching through the, the song. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, that He may present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she would be holy and blameless. And gang, that's His work. 
It's what's he, what He's doing in you. Revelation 19.7 tells us the end result. The marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready and it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And if someone says, I just feel so distant from Jesus, I don't know if He really wants to take me back. Really? I mean, you, you really believe that? Seriously, knowing the character of Jesus Christ... Knowing who He is, do you really think that He doesn't want to take you back? Or is that actually self-pity at work? Or is it perhaps self-indulgence at work? Self-pity, oh, He couldn't take me, or self-indulgence. i got some stuff going on that I can't do if I'm with Him. And let me tell you, either way, whether it's self-pity or self-indulgence, get your eyes off yourself and put them back on Jesus where they belong And ask the first question again, what kind of beloved is our beloved? I'll tell you what kind. He's one who is so invested in you, he does not want to let you go. But he does want you to realize you need him. The gap closes even more as I recognize the qualities of Jesus, as I see the qualities of Jesus, even at work in me. But watch this, she's coming around and she's getting warmer. One more question that leads the estranged wife directly into the arms of her beloved. Did you see it? It's in verse 1 of chapter 6. Where has your beloved gone? Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? Where has your beloved gone? It's the question to answer when you feel estranged from the Lord. Well, if I knew that, I wouldn't be estranged, would I? (laughs) But you do know. You do know where he's gone. You do know where he is. Verse 2. My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of balsam. Stop right there. He did go down to a garden, to a bed in a garden. He did that for you and for me. John 19.41 says in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. He went down to a garden. But that's not the garden that she's talking about. Read on. To pasture his flock in the gardens and gather lilies. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He who pastures his flock among the lilies. Where has your beloved gone? She's gone down. He's gone down to the garden. To the garden. That, that's where he, I know where he is. She, says, she comes to the realization. Aha! That's where he is. He's in the garden. Great. Where's the garden? Look in chapter 4, verse 12. He is singing and he says, A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. Gang, she is the garden. It's her heart. Where is my beloved gone? Nowhere. He's right there. He has never left. He is still in the garden of your heart. He is still present with you. He has not left you for one second. But I feel estranged. Yeah, you do. Because you're not paying attention or because whatever distractions are happening in your life or because he's allowing you to feel some sense of absence so you can realize your need for him. But the second you realize how much you need Jesus, he's right there and he never left. He is in the garden of the heart. Look at what she says in verse 16 of chapter 4. Awake, O north wind. Come, wind of the south. Make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved... Come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. She opens her heart to him. And he comes flooding in. Verse 1 of chapter 5, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I've eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I've drunk my wine and my milk. I am there. I'm in the heart. I'm in your garden. That's where I am. And I never left. Jesus said in John 15, Abide in me. And I in you. He says, My Father and I, we will come and we will make our abode in your heart. That's what happens when you give your heart to Jesus Christ. You didn't enter into a religious structure. 
You entered into a relationship where Jesus says, I am present in your heart and I'm not going anywhere and you just need to realize how much you need me to be right there. So why do I feel the distance? So we'd realize the need. She remembers that and suddenly he's right there. So what kind of beloved is your beloved? Who am I because of him? Where has he gone? He's gone to the garden of the heart. Jesus, I just pray that you would make us so aware of your presence that we would want no other thing, no other person. Lord, just to be with you. Just to be aware of you. And Father, for some, if we are in that place of just assuming it's all good, and you're trying to take us to deeper places and and richer relationship, and we're putting you off, Maybe because, hey, we're into the good book. We're all taken care of. It's good. We're fine. We don't need any more of you. Lord, show us our need. Reveal to us how desperately we need you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.